contacted me a few a uh, few weeks ago and asked uh, if I would come and preach uh, while he's out being a bum on the beach. And I was excited to come back. And uh, and whenever whenever we talked, whenever we had talked, Rick asked me if I would wrap up a series that you guys are in called Acceptable Sins. Uh, and we agreed that it would be a really good idea to cap off this series with an encouragement to you guys on fighting your sin, right? So fighting your sin, that's kind of the, the theme that we're going with this morning. He wanted me to preach on pride initially, and I was like, come on, man, like, let's wrap this up. Let's encourage the people. Let's give them some ammo to go and, and fight these sins that you've been talking about. Um, so if you guys will go ahead and open up your Bibles or your electronic devices, whatever you use, to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be in verses 4 and 5. It's also going to be on the projector here behind me. Um, but this morning, we're going to talk about how the believer overcomes the world by faith. All right, so studying this was a great encouragement to me. I preached this sermon uh, about a month ago to my congregation, um, and, and people said this was like an encouraging thing. I thought I wanted to, to give this to you this morning. Uh, but I'm sure as you guys have, have been going through this series of acceptable sins, you've realized that no sin is really acceptable. Uh, and that you've been reflecting on your sins and seeing them more and more clearly as Rick has, has been teaching you. And I'm sure that you guys have been seeing the awfulness, uh, and as the Puritans would say, the sinfulness of sin more and more uh, as you've went through this series. You've got to see how destructive that even the smallest sins are. Um, and I'm, and I'm, I pray that you guys have received a stronger desire to rid yourselves of the things that God hates. Uh, now I'm sure as the weeks have went on, uh, you've become more and more aware of how much you sin and how impossible it is to perfectly obey God, right? Like if nothing else, like Rick said, going over these acceptable sins, sins that we don't tend to think about too much, once you bring those things to light, you can really see, I cannot obey God perfectly. I am a sinner. I am a miserable wretch. There is no way that I can do this day in, day out. I can't hit it 10 for 10. But I think that sometimes we focus so much on our depravity and so much on our inability to perfectly keep the law of God that we can forget that we are overcomers. Right? You ever got down into that pit, like you reflect on your sins so much and you're just like, Lord, I'm not a good son. Right? I'm not a good child of God. I cannot stop sinning. And, and you think on that so much, you become a navel gazer and you forget that you are indeed an overcomer. Now, something I've noticed in studying the Bible that I think is really interesting is that God often tells us what we are, right? He tells us what he has made us into by his grace. And then the call is for us to go and be what God has already said that we are, right? He does it all the time. He says, you are this, now go out and be that. I have already infallibly declared these things over you. Now go and be those things. And it seems kind of strange to us. It doesn't come easily to us. It's a weird way to think. But I believe that if we take seriously this decree that God has placed over us, that we are overcomers, we will find the strength and the grace to actually see it realized in our lives. Uh, so if you're here and, and you're a Christian, this message that we're about to read from John is incredibly positive to you. If you've repented and believed the gospel, if you have been born again, we're going to talk about the new birth a lot. If you've been born again, this is an incredibly encouraging message to you. Uh, but if you're here and you're not a believer, if you've not repented of your sins, if you're not following Christ, we're glad you're here. I'm super stoked that you've decided to join us. Keep seeking, keep coming back, keep asking questions. Uh, but I'll lay this before you. Uh, you are a slave to the world. If you're an unbeliever, you're a slave to the world. And you cannot overcome anything of any spiritual, eternal significance because you love the world. The world is your master. You're a slave to sin. But I hope that this sermon will let you see the freedom that Christ offers. All right, so with that being said, here's my thesis statement. If you're a, if you're a note taker, uh, we got some nerds at my church that like to write stuff down. Um, here, here's here's the, the big push of this sermon. It's this, the believer overcomes whatever would draw us away from God. And we conquer, we overcome by our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So with that being said, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? 
This is the word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. Apart from your revelation in the scriptures, we are like blind men groping around in darkness and there's nothing for us. Lord, we thank you for your word to us that we might see rightly, that we might see ourselves rightly, that we might see the Savior rightly, and that we might follow after Him, that we might see Your great and precious promises to us in Your Word, that we might believe them, that we might place our confidence in You and what You've spoken. Lord, for the believers that are here, I pray by the work of Your Holy Spirit that You would empower us and strengthen us to overcome these sins in our lives. And if there are any unbelievers here among us, I pray that you would begin to woo them to Christ. That you would begin to show them the grace of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, and their inability to overcome sin and the penalty that comes with dying in their sins. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so verse 4. John starts out with, this is how we do stuff at Rev. I just kind of break verses down and we'll just kind of walk through some stuff. So verse 4, the first half, John starts off by saying, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. So John starts off by saying that the person who has been born again, that's what it means to be born of God, born of the Holy Spirit, overcomes the world. That person overcomes the world. Now that is a powerful thought, to overcome the world. So we need to understand what John means by the word world here, right? That Greek word cosmos. What does he mean here? It's a little easier, in my opinion, because I'm kind of a jerk, to start off with what John doesn't mean, right? It's always way more fun to talk about what he doesn't mean before you talk about what he does mean. So whenever John says, you overcome the world if you've been born again, John is not saying that you can do whatever you set your mind to. Right? That's not what John is saying. He is not saying that we can hit the home run or score the touchdown or get the promotion or find the spouse or have the child or get the thing that I want because I'm a Christian. That's not what John is saying in this passage. People can take this verse and do what they do to Philippians 4.13, right? where you just rip it straight out of its biblical context and just make it mean whatever you want. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? And that's like the number one athletic slogan for Christians. Which, by the way, if you're ever watching like a pickup game of baseball and you see the guy with the Philippians 4.13 shirt on strike out, it's hilarious. Right? Because you're like, yeah, you can do all things through Christ except hit that ball, huh? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Right? But that's not what Paul's talking about whenever he says that. Philippians 4.13, he's saying, I'm content with Christ. Whether I have a lot or whether I have nothing, whether I have friends or I'm all by myself, I know Christ. Christ Christ strengthens me to be content. Right? I can suffer all things because of him, right? So again, people can take Philippians 4.13, rip it out of context. They can take 1 John 5.4 and rip it out of context and say, I can get whatever I want because I'm a Christian. And that's not what John is saying here. Other people can take this, and I've seen this done, and it's also hilarious. Uh, People will take these words of John and try to apply them to the political realm, right? We overcome the world if we're Christians, Like Christians overcome the world by destroying their political enemies and setting up some kind of theocracy. I've seriously, I've seen people do this, and they think that this verse is a promise of victory in, quote, Christianizing the world. That Christians are going to have some kind of earthly dominance because we overcome the world. Um, But that's not going to happen this side of the return of Christ. Right? Jesus Christ himself said, my kingdom is not of this world, so it's a foolish thought to think that we're going to run this place. That's silly. But if I think if we look at the context, if we look at the context of this verse, we can see what John is talking about. If you look up in verse 3, John's talking about the commandments of God. He says, God's commandments are not burdensome. And then verse 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. So what John does in verse 3, he talks about obeying the commandments of God, that God's commandments aren't a burden to the Christian. Why? Because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. So what John has done is he links overcoming the world with obedience to God's law not being a burden to us. Okay? This is all going to tie in together. I'm just laying some foundation work. So you believe what the scripture says. Don't believe what I say. Okay? So John's linking overcoming the world with obedience. And I think that tells us what the, what the word world means in this context. 
If we overcome the world, and that means to be an obedient people, then I think the world here means sin at work around us. Right? World, often in John's writings, refers to that rebellious world system that is opposed to God, opposed to His truth, His Christ, His law, and His gospel. Right? So the world is anything that would draw us away from faithfulness to God. The world here is anything that would tempt us to sin or tempt us to abandon Christ. Now, I think that we can divide world into two categories, right? The the internal, or rather internal, I don't know what I'm doing with my hands. The internal and the external world, right? The world within and the world without. Now, when I say the internal world that we are to overcome is our sinful nature, Right? So don't get me wrong, though the Christian has been born again and given a new nature in that new birth of the Holy Spirit, though that is true, we still have what the Puritans called our remaining corruptions to deal with, do we not? If you've been a Christian for five minutes, you know what I'm talking about. Right? You still have this indwelling sin in you that, that you still must overcome. Right? Now the sin nature has been mortally wounded, praise God, it's been mortally wounded by Christ's work. But it does not fully die until we do. Um, John Owen talked about in his book, The Mortification of Sin, he says that our sinful nature is in its death throes and it lashes out at us, right? Tempting us to sin. But whenever I'm talking about the internal sinful nature, these are the internal temptations to sin, right? Like you don't need anyone to help you sin, do you? Right? Like I don't. Like story time. Uh, A few weeks ago, my wife's car got smacked in the Kroger parking lot. Um, and I got an estimate on that, and that was $2,000. Uh, and then she had to get new tires. That was $560. And then we owed $1,100 in taxes this year. I don't know how. Uh, I hate the government. Anyway, um, so I, I look. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Romans 13, submit to the governing authorities. They're, God, they're God-given. That was a joke. Right, but I looked at all this, and it's like $3,500 or something that I got to pay out. And I was like, man, I could commit some insurance fraud. Um, <laughs> Right? That's sin, right? Like I just lie to the insurance companies and just get this thing going. That's not okay. And State Auto, if you're listening to this, uh, I didn't do that at all. Right? But like no one had to tell me to do that. Right? Like I just I thought of that by myself. Right? Internal temptations to sin. This is the world within. No one needs to help you sin, right? People like to blame everything on the devil. You don't need the devil to tempt you to sin. You're a sinner. It's in your, I mean, for real, it's in your nature. You are born rebellious and opposed to God. You don't need help sinning. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, For the mindset on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not obey His laws. Indeed, it cannot. Right? We don't need help to sin. Our sinful nature does it all by itself. But these, this internal nature, this internal impulse to sin without anyone prompting us to do so, right? you know what I'm talking about. Someone offends you at work. You want to hate them. No one has to tell you, hey, you should really hate that person. You just want to hate them. Something doesn't work, like you're messing with your phone and it won't work. You want to chuck it across the room, right? You, you, what I'm getting at is in a, in a nutshell, something happens and you want to respond in sin. That world within is always a temptation because it's with you until you die. And then there's the external world, right? Right? And this is the sinful world at work around us. And this one's pretty easy to see, just a few examples. This could be the social ostracism that comes with living faithfully to Christ. Right? Where you're following Christ's commands, you're telling people the gospel, you're warning them of the wrath to come and the hope that is in Christ. And in doing so, you're losing friends and you're angering your family. You may lose your job, you may lose your business because you will not compromise on the truth. And this brings with it the temptation to sit down and shut up when you should be openly living out your faith. You should be openly speaking up. Or this world uh, around us, this external world, could be the violent persecution that we see our brothers and sisters dealing with globally. Where someone comes to them and tells them, your faith or your life. Which is then a temptation for them to abandon the faith entirely. And sin, commit the sin of apostasy. Or... I think this is the easiest one for us to see. The, the external world temptation could just be the normalizing of sin. Right? Tell me that's not prevalent in our culture. Right? We live in one of the most pornified nations on the face of the earth. 
right? Where we're constantly being pressured to celebrate and enjoy the things God hates. And if you don't, you face the consequences of that. You face the, 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 the government on that if you don't celebrate what God hates. You face the wrath of society around you because sin is being normalized. And that tempts us to then go with the flow and allow sin in our lives because, it's, it's, again, it's acceptable. It's normalized, right? It's an acceptable sin. It's not that big of a deal. Everyone does it, and we're just going to go with the flow and think that it's not a big deal. Right? But for all of this, that would draw us away from God, both internally and externally. John says, whoever is born of God overcomes. Whoever is born of God overcomes. Now the word overcome here has the Greek root word nike, right? N-I-K-E, Nike, right? How genius was that, right? For a sporting brand, to overcome, right? The word nike, um, it, it, it means victory, right? It means to conquer, to conquer something. So John is telling us that the believer conquers. The believer has victory over everything that would draw us away from God. So again, John has holiness in mind here. John has sanctification in mind here, our obedience to God. He's saying that the believer conquers sin and temptation and Satan. That's what he's getting at here. Now I want to make a note on this. I mean, this isn't me being harsh. I, I, I said this exact same thing to my church. To conquer something implies a battle. Right? You go to war. You don't just walk in and take the place. There's going to be opposition. And if we are going to conquer sin, if we're going to conquer temptation, we will be met with much opposition. If we're going to conquer our sin and the temptations of sin, much opposition. But those who have been born of God, those who have been born again of the Holy Spirit, have been born to fight. You've been born to fight. You've been given a, you've been given a warring nature. We have been born again to wage war on whatever would keep us from our God. So just in light of that, let me, let me just lay this down there for you because one thing that, that I... I I fear in a lot of churches in the West is that there are many false converts. There are many people who think that they're Christians and they're not. There are many people who would claim to be born again who have not been born again. So just let me lay this out there for you. Where there is no battle against the world, where there is no battle against sin and temptation, there has been no new birth. Right there, You have not been born again. And where there is no new birth, there is no salvation. Jesus says, unless you be born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it. Right? So again, where there's no fight against sin, there has been no new birth. And where there is no new birth, there is no salvation. Many people say, tell me if this sounds familiar, I struggle with this sin. Or I struggle with that sin. Right? People talk like that. Um... But there really is no struggle. Right? I'm just keeping it real here, right? At least among like circles that I run in, I struggle with this. Is Christian talk for, yeah, dude, I do that sin a lot. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? Someone comes up and says, yeah, man, I really struggle with watching pornography. It's like, okay, well, what, what, what steps are you taking to stop doing that? <laughs> uh, well, nothing, really. Oh, we got a big struggle you got going on there. You're really putting on your boots and fighting, aren't you? Right? That's nonsense. And I'll say this. Check your own hearts on that. I'm not saying that everyone who says that or, or talks like that, that I struggle, is like that. But there must be an actual fight against sin. And there must be an actual battle in our hearts and lives against sin if we have been saved. But the Christian, on the other hand, right, as opposed to the false convert, the Christian looks to conquer sin every day. Right? We go looking for it. We're like hunters, right? We go looking for it in our lives. We reflect on our thoughts and on our words and on our actions of the day, seeking to find the sin in our lives so that we can repent and then seek to kill it. What measures do I need to take? What is it that I need to believe in the scriptures, right? That I might overcome this. We fight daily against the world's temptation, weighing everything that we're told, everything that we see against the word of God. And then even whenever something seems good to us and seems right to us, we ask ourselves, what has God said about this in his word? 
right? And then we, like Bereans, right? Like the book of Acts. We, we search the scriptures to see if it is so. And then we reject the deception and the lies of the world and embrace the truth of God. We are a people, Christian. We are a people who always have a filter on. We're like soldiers in a war. We are always on guard. And we fight, right? And we fight, and this is a, this is a huge motivation to the fight. We fight because we know that God did not save us so that we would remain the same. Right? And again, in a lot of evangelical Christianity, we focus only on the fact that I have been saved from the wrath of God and heaven will be my home. And glory to God, that is beautiful. That is one of my favorite doctrines to talk about. But the Bible also teaches that we have been saved not only from the penalty of our sin, but from the power of sin in our lives. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ did not just die so that we might be forgiven of our sins, but he died to set us free from the power of sin in our lives, to set us free from the slavery that we had to sin. Before you were a Christian, all you could do is sin. Like I quoted in Romans 8, you were hostile to God. You did not obey his commands. Paul says, indeed, you could not obey his commandments. But now that you've been born again, you've been given a new heart with new desires to follow him, to obey him. You've been given that ability that you did not have. But I want to be really clear on something else, too. I know I've talked about overcoming sin, and and the fight must be real if you're a Christian. Don't misunderstand me on this. I'm not a legalist. (laughs) All right? To overcome does not imply sinlessness. Oh, please hear that, Christian. I know there are weary Christians here, I'm sure, who are fighting the fight against their sin. And they've lost at some point, not eternally, but they've lost at some point this past week and they're beaten down by their sin. John is not implying that the Christian will be sinless. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. <laughs> right? So God, he's not saying that we're going to be perfectly sinless. Right? We don't believe in sinless perfection. Right? Unless you're one of those goofy people that thinks that the, the, it's a, work of, a second work of grace, full sanctification. No, sanctification like, happens in its fullness when you die and not any time before that. That's another, I'll fight you in the parking lot about that. We'll talk about that out there. <laughs> right, so he's not implying sinless perfection, right? Christians still sin. But, hear me on this, the true Christian is not beaten every day. I'm not saying you don't sin every day. I'm saying you are not beaten down all day, every day. There is always a measure of victory, right? And what I mean by that, even if the measure of victory is our repentance from the sin that we committed, that is victory. To repent and believe the gospel again, to daily repent and and be, like we said, I, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. To daily renew our faith in the Christ who saved us and say, I'm following you again. That is victory. Because that's not natural. That's not something that the world does. That's something that the people of God do. All right, that is victory and we fight. But I want to highlight something here. Uh, I, I love that John declares our victory even as the battle rages on. Right? He says we overcome. We overcome. We are now presently overcoming the world. We have overcome. John has actually said this earlier in his letter in 1 John chapter 2, verse 14. He says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Have overcome, like past tense. You have overcome. So though our conquering implies a daily fight with sin and temptation, it also points us to the truth that we are eternally victorious already. All right, and this is our hope. This is our daily hope in the midst of the battle. This is what encourages us to keep fighting. We've already won. If you're a Christian, we, you have already won this battle against sin. John Calvin talked about it like this way in his commentary of this passage. He said, it's as if in the midst of the fight, while the soldiers are warring on the field, Jesus Christ raises a banner of victory and all on the field look to it and are invigorated for the fight. You know that you've already won because Christ has won. 
But, but why, why do we overcome? I think there's a why and there's a how in these two verses. Why do we overcome? Well, first, John says everyone born of God overcomes. John ties it directly to the new birth, right? I mean, being born again is a huge theme uh, for, for John. And I hate it that in uh, American evangelicalism, being born again is like a phrase that only crazy people use, right? Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Like you got that one guy who's always talking about like being born again and it just like kind of robs us of how good that that phrase is, how good this theology is. But it's a huge deal to John. He ties being born of God to overcoming. So in God causing us to be born again, he has given us a new nature, right? And he has given us the gift of faith and has set us free from our for- former slavery to sin that we might repent and savingly believe on Christ, We've been given this new nature by the new birth, and now the Holy Spirit dwells in us continually. Right? You guys know this passage, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Right? The new birth brings with it a new nature. Now let me just try just three quick things about how, uh, or rather why, this new nature is the reason we overcome. The first is this, the new nature is utterly important for us because the new nature is the only thing that can fight the world, right? The unconverted person, the unbeliever, the unregenerate cannot even begin to fight sin, cannot even begin to fight temptation in a true sense because they are in the flesh. And what I mean by that is if you're an unbeliever, you're going to exchange one sin for another, Right? Like, yeah, man, I quit using drugs and I picked up the sin of pride and I think that I'm better than everyone who does drugs now. Right? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, usually, that's how it works out. The unbeliever lays down one sin and picks up another one. Right? Or I used to be a lazy bum and now I got a job and I'm super greedy. Right? But there is no real desire in the unbeliever to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Right? It's just an exchange of sin. Without the new birth, without the new nature from God, you are still part of the world. And you will not fight what you're a part of. The new nature from God is absolutely essential. Two, it is only the new nature that can continue the fight. All all human effort will wear out. Right? All human effort will wear out. A person can try to reform their life externally. Right? Behavior modification. But the heart hasn't changed. So like I said in the first point, the actions will eventually revert or go on to another sin. Human effort will tire out. Apart from the aid of the Holy Spirit, it is only a matter of time before the unsaved person, working in their own strength, plunges headlong into the sin that they love. But the new new nature keeps us Christians fighting. It will not permit us to rest in our sin. Are you ever woke up, Christian, and thought, like, I just want to give this whole following Jesus thing up? You can, I have. I'm just going to be honest. Like, some of you don't want to say that, don't want to admit that. I will. Right? You're just like, I, I just want to quit. But you can't. <laughs> like, seriously, you ever had that? Like, I would stop doing this, but I can't unknow what I know. And I know how good God is, and no matter how hard this is, I must keep fighting. I can't stop following him. Right? The new nature keeps us fighting. And thirdly, the new nature is utterly important. It is, the, it is the why we overcome, because the new nature has been born to conquer. It's been born to conquer. It has been born in us to rule over our sinful nature. Right? It, it has been born to give us desires greater than the temptations of the world. Right? So don't make this mistake. Some people think that our old sinful nature has been modified to be a little bit better. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you have received a totally new nature that gives the victory and rules over the old one. Right? So more than that, this is nature is of God who cannot be defeated. It's a blasphemous thought to think that the Holy Spirit within us can be conquered by sin. <laughs> Blasphemy. Right, but we need to own these truths about who we are since God has caused us to be born again. We have been given a victorious nature. So please hear me on this. Stop waking up every day and thinking, same old struggles, I'm never going to kill this particular sin. I'm going to deal with this for the rest of my life. That is a lie from hell. It does not have to be so. 
The nature in you has been born to conquer. The Spirit of God lives within you. The same Spirit, I might add, who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you that you might overcome your sin. So if you cooperate with God's grace in you, in your sanctification, you will be victorious over your sin. And that tells us whenever you sin, it's not that God wasn't faithful to give you the ability to overcome, it's you just rejected the grace of God in you and went to the sin. So that's the why we overcome. But how do we overcome? John says in the second half of verse 4, we've only been in the first half of the first verse, that's wild. Don't worry, it's not going to be that much longer. He says, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? He says, our faith is the victory. Right? That's the how that we overcome. Right, but hear me on this, because that sounds like an ethereal, like an ethereal concept. What do you mean our faith overcomes something? John doesn't mean this in the modern have just have faith in something, right? Like AA and NA tells you, just believe in a higher power, just whatever, just believe in something. Right? It's not that kind of nonsense. Verse 5 tells us that it is faith in Jesus as the Son of God that overcomes the world. Right? So by our continued trust in the Lord Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as our Savior, we conquer and we overcome. But then that made me ask this question. Right? You should always ask questions when you're reading the Bible. Like, why would they say this? What does this mean? You should always ask questions. My question was this. What is it about faith in Jesus that grants us victory? What is it about faith in Christ that grants us victory? In a nutshell, and I'll go into some particulars, but I think that it's by faith in Christ that we see eternal truths and focus on them. And also by our faith in Christ, we receive and know the power and assurance of full victory. And that pushes us to continue the fight. Right? So faith is our weapon in this war. Right? And I got a few things for you on how faith in Christ causes us to overcome the world. And the first is this, and this is really simple. All of these are really, really simple. We believe in Jesus, right? When I say we believe in Jesus, we believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, that Jesus is God. Just think about that phrase for a minute. If you're a Christian, I believe that Jesus is God. Central tenet of our faith. Follow me on this. By believing that Jesus is our Lord and God, He's the creator. He owns everything. He owns me. He has saved me. He is sovereign. He is above all things. He owns everything. He is judge. He is lawgiver. He is supreme. By believing that, we maintain the freedom to obey him, no matter what tries to pull us away. And what I mean is that he is our master. Right? We have a higher master than the world. We have a higher master than ourselves. You see what I'm getting at? We are above the world's authority that would draw us to sin. We are above our own authority and our own temptations to sin. Or or rather not we are, but Christ is above our own authority. We know that we have a greater obligation to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, than we have to anything else if we really have faith that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. We are no longer slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to Christ. Our Jesus is higher. We believe in him and we follow him alone, and there is none higher than him. So why would we obey anyone else? Your faith in Jesus as God gives you strength for the fight, gives you the victory. Right? It's like a messenger for a king. Like the messenger goes into a foreign country and the people in that foreign country try to convince the messenger to bow the knee to their king and to serve another, but the messenger says, I know to whom I belong. I have a king and my king is not your king. My king is Christ. Likewise, we are sojourners and we have a king and we serve him. Another reason that our faith overcomes, another way our faith overcomes the world is that by faith in Christ, we have daily communion with God. 
right? Christ is our mediator. We have communion with God through Christ. And we have this communion through the means of grace given to us by God. We have this communion with God through the scriptures, through prayer, right? God talks to us. In prayer, we talk back, right? In our corporate worship, what we're doing now, this is communion with God. By taking the Lord's Supper, we have communion with God. All of those things, right? The means of grace, we have communion with Him. And in all of these things, we are daily, regularly feeding on Christ, as Jesus talks about in John's Gospel. Being in daily communion with God sanctifies us. It shows us our sin. It shows us what's wrong with us and what's right with Christ. It points us to the truth. It lets us see what truly matters, and it strengthens us for the fight. So our daily, or by faith, we have communion with God. Third, by faith in Christ, this is big. We don't think about this enough anymore. Our grandparents probably did, or my grandparents did, if any of you are in that age. It's cool. Um, by faith in Christ, we believe in the reward that awaits the Christian. We forget about reward sometimes. We don't know. Christ is worthy to be obeyed regardless of whether or not he gave a reward, but indeed he did give a reward to those who believe and follow him. So that's something that we should think about, right? And that reward is eternity with our God. Let me, let me read just some passages out of Revelation 2 and 3 that talks about the overcomer and the reward promised to them. This is just chapters 2 and 3. I'm scattered. I'm going to blast through them. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. To the one who conquers, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a stone with a new name written on the stone. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. What a promise to the one who conquers. To the one who daily, diligently seeks to kill our sin as we trust in Christ. To the one who conquers, to the one who is faithful to the end, this is what is promised. And this promise of reward fuels us and strengthens us for the fight. It's like a soldier who whenever they're out in the field and they're fighting, they know that when they come home from the war, that they come home to a king's palace. A place where they'll never be hungry, never be hurt, never have to fight again, will be forever loved, and will reign side by side with the king. Compared to this reward promised us, every vain sinful pleasure that the world can offer is a mere trinket to be put on a shelf and never thought of again. The reward promised to us is so much greater. And lastly, we overcome in this way by faith. We have been united with Christ. This is the biggest one. By faith, we have been united with Christ. Whatever the Son has is ours. The whole bridegroom analogy that you read about in the New Testament where the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus is the bridegroom. That's what it's like. Whatever he has is now ours because we have been married to him. We have been united with him by faith. And what does Christ have? He has victory over the world. Gospel of John 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome sin. I have overcome temptation in your place. Christ not only died for us, he lived for us. He kept the law that we could not keep perfectly in our place. And the Bible says by faith we've been united with him, we have been clothed in his righteousness, and when judgment day comes we are judged off of his perfection, not our sin. He has overcome the world, and by our faith we have been united with him, and his perfection is ours. His victory over sin is now my victory. It's your victory, Christian. Knowing that you have already won. Knowing that you will win. That this is an eternal, decisive victory that you have from Christ Jesus. Knowing that, 
Not only gives you peace and comfort for the life to come, but it encourages the fight now to know you've already won. All you need to do is stand behind the conquering King Jesus and follow him. You have won, Christian. You have won. Now I have two simple points of application for you in light of these truths. And the first is this. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Like Paul tells Timothy, wage the good warfare. I love that verse. Never stop. Don't give up. The Christian life is a life of war. So I encourage you, enter the kingdom of God with some scars. Keep fighting. In the words of Paul, leave no provision for the flesh. Seek to kill even the smallest sins. Leave no quarter for the enemy. Strive for the holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. And know that you can win over your sin. John says, it's a message of victory. Whoever has been born of God overcomes the world. You do not have to be mired down in sin. You have overcome. You've been given a victorious nature. The Holy Spirit is in you. By faith we fight and win. And my second point is this. When you grow weary of the fight, and you will, when you begin to think, I can't do it, I can't win, when you feel defeated, know, know in your heart that the Lord Jesus has already won the war for you. Know that, Christian. If you do not, you will be destroyed in this fight. The Lord Jesus has won the war for the believer. His victory is your victory. You win because he has won. Victory has been granted to all who have laid hold of Christ by faith. I'll leave you guys with a quote from the greatest preacher who's ever lived, Charles Spurgeon. Behold your conflict, born to battle but behold your triumph, bound to conquer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the victory that we have in your son, Jesus. Please strengthen the faith of all the believers that are gathered here this morning that we might see Jesus is God, that we might be radically convinced of the truths that we've looked at this, this morning. Lord, stamp eternity on our hearts. Let us see the great reward promised to the one who overcomes. Let us see Christ as the sovereign ruler of the universe. Let us see our communion with you strengthens us. Lord, make us a people who hate what you hate and love what you love. Make us a people who fight our sin while resting in Christ. Make us into a holy people. What I'm asking, Lord, is that you would make us conformable to the image of your son. Please make us into a holy people. Thank you for the comfort that is ours that Jesus has already won for us. And Lord, for the unbelievers present, I pray that they would be enticed by this promise of victory over sin. That you would let them get their gut full of sin that they might run to the Savior. Lord, we bless you and praise you forever. You are king and worthy of all of our praise. In Christ's name, amen.